Hello, and uh, my name is Katie Mercier. I'm CJJ's Communications Associate, and welcome to CJJ's webinar on child trafficking and juvenile justice. This is the first in a series of webinars we'll be doing on trafficking over the next year, and we're very excited to have our presenters with us. Before we begin, I just want to run through a couple of technical details. First, you'll notice that all participants are in listen-only mode, uh, which means that you are muted. Uh, we'll do Q&A at the end of the presentation, but throughout the presentation, you can type in your questions throughout the, through the questions box, and we'll be able to read them aloud at the end. The other alternative is that you can click at the end of the presentation the raise your hand button, and I can unmute you and announce you, and you can ask your question. I do ask that if you are on a cell phone to use the questions box. That way we can avoid any audio feedback issues. And with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have Beth Benning, who is a Training and Technical Assistance Specialist at Polaris. Her core responsibilities include liaising with federal task forces, developing and delivering specialized curriculum, providing training, conducting research related to human trafficking network trends, and assisting with a variety of special projects for their national programs. She has conducted trainings for diverse audiences that include law enforcement, military personnel, international delegations, healthcare professionals, travel industry leaders, service providers, and community members. Starla Bardine is the Executive Director of the National Network for Youth. She is connected to runaway and homeless youth providers throughout the United States and the youth they serve. She is a federal policy expert and has dedicated her career to fighting for federal policies that are rooted in the real lives and experiences of people and communities. She enjoys working collaboratively to push for common sense policies so that all communities are able to effectively serve homeless youth in crisis. Our final speaker is Naomi Smoot, who is the Policy and Government Relations Associate at the Coalition for Juvenile Justice. She assists in the development and implementation of nationwide initiatives in juvenile justice leadership and reform with CJJ state members as well as state and national partners. She is involved, also involved in field development and outreach. She is a recent graduate of the University of the District of Columbia Law School, has done juvenile defense work, and was a newspaper reporter prior to law school. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our speaker. Thanks, Katie. So this is Beth, and I'll be your first presenter today. And I did want to just review training objectives before we dive into the content of the webinar. So this training is really designed as an introduction to the issue of trafficking as it relates to your context. Today we'll be providing you all with the definition of this crime. We'll be describing venues, recruitment tactics, and relationship dynamics for child trafficking. We'll be discussing intersections with juvenile and criminal justice providing an overview of state and federal legislation relevant to your role, and examine current efforts to address the needs of this victim population. You can go to the next slide. So in order to understand the scope of child trafficking in the United States, we've woven a handful of estimates together throughout this webinar from a variety of resources focused on this issue. That said, I'll be the first to acknowledge that numbers are the Achilles heel of the anti-trafficking field. The field currently lacks data on the exact prevalence of this issue, but we can still learn a great deal about the breadth of this problem from what is available to us from sources such as the International Labor Organization, which you see here in this slide, the National Center for Mis Missing and Exploited Children, the Urban Institute, and the OJJDP-sponsored report confronting commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking of minors in the U.S., to name a few. So according to the most recent stats from the ILO, there are nearly 21 million people in human trafficking today. That means three out of every 1,000 people worldwide are thought to be in trafficking situations. Now, in terms of that breakdown to explain the pie chart you see on this slide, 90% of these victims, or 18.7 million, are exploited in the private economy by individuals or enterprises, uh, and specifically through labor uh, in industries such as agriculture, construction, domestic work, or manufacturing, which is really interesting because, at least in the United States, from a media standpoint, sex trafficking is the issue that gets the greatest focus, but in reality, it's believed that labor is the larger of the two. Of these, 4.5 million, or 22%, are victims of forced sexual exploitation. And this third category on the chart of state-imposed, these 10% of victims are in states where there is some sort of institutionalized forced labor in the form of prison camps uh, or imposed by a state military or rebel forces. In 2014, the ILO conducted a study of the profits of this forced labor worldwide and determined that it brings in a profit exceeding $150 billion annually. So this is a really staggering scope to consider when we're talking about this issue. We can go to the next slide. 
since we're all working in the United States, we're going to talk about our federal legislation here. And uh, trafficking became a federal crime with the passage of the TVPA, or the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000. Prior to this time, it was widely held that human trafficking was an issue that really only plagued developing countries or was an antiquated form of slavery long since abolished here in the United States. The TVPA defines trafficking as the use of force, fraud, or coercion to compel a person into commercial sex, labor, or services against his or her will. And the statute breaks it further into two types, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. For sex trafficking, there is the sex trafficking of adults through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And then there's the sex trafficking of minors, which we're going to delve into in greater detail in this presentation. But minors who are induced into commercial sex are automatically considered victims. And that is something that I'm going to repeat throughout the portion of the webinar. Um, and you know, our laws reflect the policy that all minors in this situation should be considered victims of sex trafficking rather than criminals or delinquents, and thus treated accordingly. Now, in contrast, the definition of labor trafficking includes the use of force, fraud, or coercion to compel an individual, either an adult or a child, into performing labor or services. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the legalese, but we've listed the statute here for anyone who's interested in further reading. And we're going to use the next slide, um, the action, means, and purpose model, to break it down into layman's terms. Now, for a case to be considered trafficking, at least one element, and only one, from all of these three columns must be present. So human trafficking occurs when a trafficker takes an action, such as the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, or obtaining of an individual by force, fraud, or coercion for the purposes of compelling that victim to provide commercial sex or labor or services. So it's sort of like a formula, and you only need one. Now, the presence of force, fraud, or coercion indicates that the victim has not consented to provide this commercial sex or labor against their will. And one, a common misconception we still see today is a lot of people assume that trafficking assumes transportation. But as you can see here in this model, trafficking is only one element that could be present on the action portion of this. Now, the exception to this, if we'll go to the next slide, occurs when minors are involved in commercial sex. According to the TDPA, the question of consent is irrelevant. A minor under 18 years of age engaging in commercial sex may be considered a victim of trafficking even if forced fraud or coercion are not used. So that middle column disappears. A commercial sex act is a sex act on account of which anything of value is given to you or received by any person. In this situation, the minor is sexually exploited for something of value. Children who are trafficked for sex are induced to engage in sex in exchange for money or goods or services, either for themselves or for the profit of someone else, such as a trafficker. So I will just hit this, emphasize that point that commercial sex can be sex in exchange for anything of value. It does not necessarily have to be money. And I will note also that philosophically, we approach child sex trafficking as a form of child abuse, but I do understand that it is not classified as such under many state laws. Now we're going to delve into some means of control. Now most of us are familiar with what force entails. This can include all manner of physical or sexual assault, physical isolation, or confinement. Uh, an example of fraud might entail bringing someone to the United States under false pretenses, uh, telling someone that you love them and then using that relationship to exploit them, fraudulent employment offers, or the withholding of wages. Now when it comes to coercion, this is one of the most powerful and most utilized means of control that we're seeing through the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline. And that is because it does not leave much physical evidence, and the fear of the unknown, whether that threat of harm to that victim or their family can really be enough to keep a victim silent and compliant with that trafficker's request. Examples of coercion include threats of serious harm uh, to themselves, to their family, the abuse of the legal process. In many cases, we see, in particular, foreign national victims whose passports or visas are taken away from them. We also see this in domestic situations where their form of identification, whether it's a driver's license, is also taken from them. But we're also going to see psychological manipulation, which I'm going to delve into in greater detail using the power and control wheel later in this presentation. But really, when it comes to coercion, we're talking about any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause belief that you or someone else may be injured in some way. And it's important to note 
that forced fraud and coercion must be understood from the victim's perspective. So what might not control you or I might be very real and uh, very, very prevalent uh, to someone else. We'll go to the next slide. So this is just a reminder that we are talking about the purpose for commercial sex. Again, money does not necessarily have to be involved, um, or labor or services. Now, this is relevant to this context because this does include the provision of a sexual act in exchange for something of value, like food or shelter or drugs. And this is a particular note for runaway and homeless youth who might engage what is commonly referred to as survival sex to get by. Now, in this next slide, we have another heat map um, generated by the National Human Trafficking Resource Center um, to give you an idea of the scope of this issue and what we're seeing from our perspective. So these calls uh, are referencing child trafficking from December 2007 through September of this year. And we fielded calls over referencing some over 4,300 cases of potential trafficking in the U.S., and approximately 91% of these cases have involved victims who are identified as female. 9% of these potential victims were identified as male, and some 1% of these cases reference potential victims who were transgender. Now, I say potential because we are not a law enforcement entity. We cannot go out and investigate uh, the claims on these calls. That said, these 4,300 cases had very high, um, if not moderate, indicators of trafficking. Now, in terms of nationality, approximately 53% of these cases reference potential victims who are U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents. Alternatively, approximately 19% of these cases reference foreign national victims with arrests of unknown status. Now, I'm going to discuss venues in more detail, but overwhelmingly, we're seeing trafficking cases that involve minors tied to hotel and motel-based commercial sex, internet-based commercial sex, street prostitution, and on the labor side, domestic servitude and traveling sales crews. Now, the caveat to these numbers, as any hotline will tell you, um, is that you know we are only as strong as awareness of our issue and awareness of the hotline. Um, I have a lot of people that ask me if you know their city in particular is a particular hotbed. And while we certainly see a concentration around urban areas, that does not mean that the blank areas of the map, that there is not trafficking present there. It might be more of an indication of their lack of understanding or lack of awareness of this crime and knowing who to call and where the resources are. We can go to the next slide. Another reliable source of information or data on this um, is actually FBI Innocence Law. So since 2003, they've had this initiative that to date resulted in the recovery of over 3,600 child victims and the conviction of nearly 1,500 traffickers. Now, these task forces that comprise the Innocence Loss Initiative have really made a huge impact in coordinating their efforts. And uh, this July, they conducted uh, Operation Cross Country 8, where they recovered nearly 170 child victims, arresting over 280 traffickers across 106 cities nationwide. And this is with the help of state and local law enforcement and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, in 2013, NCMEC found that one out of seven endangered runaways reported to their hotline were likely child sex trafficking victims. So this is certainly something that um, various access points in this field are seeing. Now, in terms of victim profile, um, this crime is very complex. It's often hidden or mis misidentified, giving the overlapping elements. But I do want to talk about who is vulnerable on the next slide. Victims can be any gender, race, nationality, sexual orientation, or come from any socioeconomic background. Uh, there's no one size fits all when it comes to victim profile. Um, whether there are individual social or environmental factors, um, you know, a lot of them serve to create situations of vulnerability. And it's important for you all as practitioners to be mindful of these risk factors. Vulnerable youth can really include any of the following categories. Uh, for victims of prior abuse or violence, uh, these can include children in a variety of situations where exploitative behavior is normalized, and that in turn is manipulated by traffickers. For one away and homeless youth, as with all children, age is their most vulnerable factor. There's also limited access to resources, the need for shelter, food, and other essentials. And this leaves them susceptible to the promises of care and security by traffickers and exploiters who might not have their best interest in mind. 
Individuals who are economically vulnerable to homelessness, displaced after a natural disaster or conflict, or who lack job opportunities might also be vulnerable, um, particularly when a trafficker is promising them that safety, that stability, a job, or an education that they so desperately need. But generally, we're talking about youth who lack strong social support networks or who are isolated from a community. Um, you know, for example, LGBTQI youth might be shunned by their families and feel that there is no other option than to strike out on their own. Uh, there are more localized reports or studies that have been done on victim populations. One in particular uh, from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in 2008 found that less than 10% of the interviewed youth within their sample set that had been commercially sexually exploited so that they could turn to a parent or a loved one if they found themselves in trouble, which really underscored that the lack of strong social support could make a youth vulnerable. And the reality is these youth may not know that there is a system to support them, and they might not feel comfortable accessing help given the stigma and the shame that is associated with um, some of these victim experiences, which we'll highlight in the next slide. I will say that the same study in New York City found that boys accounted for 45% of the juvenile victim surveyed, with 7% of that sampling identifying as transgender. Um, but as with all of these vulnerable groups, the inability to really identify and fend off predatory behavior poses a particular challenge when it comes to prevention. And when we talk about shifting paradigms, particularly when working with law enforcement, we're trying to shift the mindset from delinquent or offender for system-involved youth to victim. Uh, because, you know, very often these children are misidentified or they present uh, in, in, in different contexts. So I briefly touched on the means of control outlined in the federal statute, but as practitioners we know that those dynamics of power and control are incredibly nuanced. Uh, traffickers really manipulate interpersonal dynamics to create complex psychological and emotional barriers for victims um, from seeking help and from keeping in, in order to keep them in that situation. And I hope this model looks familiar to most of you, if not all. Um, this human trafficking power and control wheel was modeled after the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project's Duluth model, which was originally designed for domestic violence. And this wheel, or this tool rather, is designed to help you understand the common tactics that traffickers might use to control and exploit their victims, including minors. While not all minor victims of trafficking have histories of abuse, Many have had it normalized in some way, and this normalization is another obstacle in identifying youth involved in trafficking as their perception of their situation results in their lack of a desire or the ability to really seek help. In fact, many youth do not realize the dangerousness and the exploitative nature of their situation and often confuse a trafficker's caretaking activities with truly caring. It's worth noting uh, that traffickers will really individualize their control tactics based on specific vulnerabilities of their victims, from recruitment all the way through the exploitation. And these tactics can range from very subtle but powerful forms of control, such as slowly isolating the victim from their friends and family, to extreme forms of control, such as physical and sexual abuse. And things can become even more complicated when a trafficker develops a relationship with their victim. Uh, I, posing as a caretaker or as an intimate partner, as a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And I really encourage you all, these slides are going to be shared with you after this webinar, to unpack this tool a little bit more. And if you guys have any questions, we're happy to, to answer them. So in terms of trafficker profile, like victims of trafficking, traffickers can be any gender, race, nationality, or ethnicity, and can be known or unknown to their victim. What links all traffickers together is their willingness to exploit the vulnerability of others for their own financial gain. Now on the next slide, we're going to talk about where recruitment occurs. Now when recruiting victims, particularly for commercial sexual exploitation, traffickers often seek out individuals who they perceive to be vulnerable. And they're going to employ recruitment strategies, as I've said, that are tailored to that victim, that potential victim's vulnerability. Um, as you've seen in the previous slide with the power and control wheel, these tactics could include promises of love or marriage, of better opportunities, of a shared identity or a support structure in lieu of a family. They could include blackmail or extortion, uh, solicitation by family, friends, or acquaintances. Unfortunately, there are many cases where a family member is actually the trafficker of a minor, and threats of abduction or kidnapping. Now, recruitment of youth can occur at a variety of venues that include bus stops, malls, or other social hangouts, 
weekend parties or skip parties where there might be recreational drug use and alcohol use among youth who would otherwise be in school. Uh, we've heard from educators that recruitment is done um, on school campuses, among peers, in local neighborhoods, and most prominently through social media online. And social media in particular provides an avenue through which to readily access personal information, to recruit potential victims, to groom and control them. But we also see traffickers using social media to monitor and to advertise and to harass their victims throughout the trafficking situation. So not just in the recruitment stage, but throughout their exploitation. And traffickers really use these websites to gather intel from profiles, to create fake accounts posing as peers or talent scouts, depending on what their gimmick is, and really mass men messaging potential targets who they perceive to be vulnerable. And as with everything in the online environment, you know, anonymity really affords them this unique opportunity to create these fake accounts. In, in, in um, many cases, we see that traffickers have this plausible deniability unless they can prove that they created the false username directly for that purpose. Um, for labor trafficking, you know, we do see youth that are recruited through online ads, through job postings, uh, particularly for traveling sales crews. Uh, these youth might be recruited through their friends, their family, uh, an extended network. Um, and, you know, it might be, these youth might be unaccompanied or coming from economically depressed situations, so there's this promise of employment and a steady wage that really is too good to pass up. So to talk about where trafficking occurs, um, Trafficking of minors can really occur in a variety of venues. Uh, for sex trafficking, street prostitution is probably one of the most visible avenues. Um, the prevalence of trafficking in street culture may be underestimated or overlooked because of the common misperception that people involved in prostitution are working with a trafficker or a pimp by choice. Um, and it's important to remember that anyone who induces commercial sex with a minor could be charged as a trafficker. Similarly, you know, in terms of other venues, we're seeing truck stops um, used for prostitution. Um, we have taken calls from truck drivers who noted uh, minor victims soliciting um, and, and called that into law enforcement to rescue them, to remove them from that situation. Um, and it's also important to note that there are other venues as well for indoor prostitution, um, including massage parlors or residential brothels potentially tied to a criminal entity. And these really can occur in private homes, in businesses, um, but regardless of the setting, um, the trafficker is usually sending a victim out um, or bringing in a potential buyer into that setting. The internet is also a primary venue for a lot of this as well, not only to advertise, but also to exploit. Um, and then on the labor side of things, you know, we do see labor trafficking in domestic servitude. And uh, this is a, you know, a particularly intimate crime in that these children are working in homes of family members or acquaintances of family members. They're promised often uh, an education or a better opportunity and then forced to work long hours. Um, we also see child trafficking in agriculture uh, and forestry, uh, traveling sales crews, and these are these door-to-door -door sales that we're seeing nationwide. Uh, children, you know, soliciting or the selling of wares during during school hours. They might be inappropriately dressed given the weather. Um, you know, they might not be able to account for the organization that they're representing. And they have these quotas that they have to meet. And if they don't, they're very strictly enforced or punished. And then to a lesser degree, um, at least from the hotline perspective, through service industries and small businesses. Um, we can go to the next slide. Now, before I pass this off to uh, Darla, I just do want to say that for more resources or referrals to anti-trafficking organizations in your area or to report potential trafficking cases, please call the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. Uh, this hotline is toll-free, available 24 hours a day, and our number is 1-888-3737-888. And you can also encourage um, youth that you might be working with to text help or info. We do have a texting line. That number is 233-733, and all calls are confidential and interpreters are available. Darla, over to you. Great, thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks for um, being on this webinar. Uh, my name is Darla Bardine. I'm the Executive Director of the National Network for Youth. I represent over 300 homeless youth programs throughout the country. And we envision a world where um, all vulnerable youth have a safety net everywhere they turn, creating positive and strong communities, one youth at a time. 
next slide, please. And, and first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by kind of going over what I'm going to talk with you all about today. And I'm looking forward to lots of questions and hopefully a lively conversation at the end. First, I'm going to go over some definitions, then talk about the intersection of running away with homelessness, juvenile justice involvement, and human trafficking. Then we're going to talk about some criminal justice improvements to decrease demand um, and through um, increased arrests and convictions of both buyers and sellers, and then also talking about increasing the expertise and capacity of a runaway and homeless youth programs to prevent, identify, and serve victims of human trafficking. So first, we're going to go over the definition of a runaway. Um, Next slide, please. So this is from a federal statute. It's not from a federal crime bill. The Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, which I'll talk about more later, is a federal grant program. It provides housing and different services to young people. So it's, it's not a crime bill. Um, but according to the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, anyone who's a minor eight, under the ages of 18 and leaves home um, without the permission of their family is a runaway. Also, often, state law defines a runaway as someone who leaves the home of their parent or legal guardian. And that can include the foster care system. So you can be classified as a runaway from the foster care system. Next slide, please. And so the definition of, of homeless youth, um, many young people who run away um, are also homeless. So that's why. Um, the federal grant program is called Runaway and Homeless Youth. Um, we maintain you know, the definition of runaway because it has legal meaning, especially within states. Uh, so the definition of homeless youth, it does vary by federal program. The definition that we prefer and that youth advocates prefer because it's inclusive of young people is um, either calling young people homeless youth or unaccompanied homeless youth. And it's any young person between the ages of 12 and 24 who's living on their own without a parent or guardian and is without a safe, stable living arrangement. For the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, um, young people have to be 21 or younger to be eligible for those programs. And for the US Department of Education, there is no age. Um, it's just being unaccompanied and living on your own without a parent or a guardian. And of course, that's within the context of the public school system. <laughs> so age becomes less important um, with the Department of Education. The, the big federal agency that doesn't have a definition of homeless youth and their definition of homelessness that is not youth inclusive is the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. So that's really kind of the outlier in terms of what's appropriate for young people. Next slide, please. So the intersection between all of these things, right, whether it's the foster care system, running away, the juvenile justice system, homelessness, and human trafficking, they're all very interconnected. So hopefully these next slides help unpack it for you all and, and kind of make the connections. So runaway and homeless youth uh, either run away or are kicked out of their homes. Um, and if you don't receive crisis intervention services, these young people are much more less likely to return home. They're less likely to secure safe and stable housing. They're more likely to become homeless, remain homeless, and due to their vulnerability, um, be targeted by traffickers, um, and or engage in illegal criminal behavior in order to survive. It's, there's this gray line with runaway youth um, in terms of sometimes, you know, Parents and young people will have different stories about whether a young person just left without their parents' permission and whether their parent kicked them out and made them leave. And so there is a bit of a gray area. And so it's important to, to be inclusive of minors who, who are no longer with their legal guardian, whether it's their parent or their foster care system, whether they chose, they chose to leave or um, whether they were forced to leave, because often young people run away from domestic violence, sexual abuse, family conflict, um, and other kind of family drama. The connection to the foster care system, um, a lot of research has shown that young people who enter the foster care system 
um, at the age of 12 or older are more likely to run away from foster care, usually because they have a desire to reconnect with their biological family. They have a desire to be um, with their parents or with their siblings, and so they just leave the foster care system. Also, it's been found that um, foster care youth that have multiple placements um, within a short amount of time are more likely to run away from care. Also, many young people um, become homeless after they exit the foster care system, whether they age out of the foster care system at 18 or 21, depending on the state law, or if they were placed in a kinship care placement or an adoption placement that wasn't successful. Um, so that there is this connection, kind of this multi-tiered connection between foster youth, running away, and homelessness. Next slide, please. Young people um, who are abused or homeless, vulnerable, or experience other types of violence, such as sex trafficking, labor trafficking, um, any type of domestic violence, are also more likely to suffer from mental health and substance abuse issues. That's because these young people are often self-medicating um, to the pain and trauma that they've experienced with um, what's available to them, which is usually illegal substances, because there isn't mental health and healing services available to them. And studies have shown that the longer a young person um, is homeless, the, the longer anyone is homeless, um, the mental health uh, deteriorates in a corollary to the length of time that they're homeless. Also, um, youth who are substance abusing and lack what they need to live will commit crimes to get what they need. Um, when a young person doesn't have food, um, some young people will steal to get food um, so that they can live. And, and in terms of the juvenile justice system, because young people are homeless, they spend a lot of time in public places, maybe forced to commit crimes to get what they need to live. Um, and also, um, young people may be, can be convicted in some states of, of not attending school, of truancy, or of running away. Then there's an increase, just so many increased likelihoods and kind of entry points for homeless youth or runaway youth to come in contact with the criminal justice system and to be detained. Next slide, please. And so I think to, to wrap everything up um, around the theme of this webinar, so being in a public place for extended periods of time, um, lacking proper resources to care for yourself, to live, and not having um, adults to protect you or guide you, homeless youth are just much more likely to be preyed upon adults who want to harm them and use them and much more likely to be swept into the trafficking industry. We had done a survey to homeless youth providers across the country and a lot of providers identified um, a lot of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Young people who were exchanging sex for a couch to sleep on or for a meal. Um, and also, a lot of young people were caught up in labor trafficking. In particular, forced sales rings were um, pretty popular. And that's because young people were being offered what they didn't have, right? They were being offered a job, a paycheck, food, a place to stay. Um, but what often happened is they could never meet their sales quota, so they didn't get paid. They were stuck in a motel room in strange places with like 12 people to a room. Um, so the labor trafficking is definitely um, as prevalent um, as sex trafficking, at least based on the survey that we conducted. Uh, next slide, please. So states handle um, runaway laws differently, with the exception of five states that don't make any specifications in state law, police officers can take a runaway into custody without a warrant, and that's a runaway from home or the foster care system, et cetera. Some states will release the youth into the custody of their parents or relative or the foster care system or the court, and other, other, other runaways may be brought before juvenile court and, and have a hearing and, and might go to juvenile detention. Next slide, please. Um, and then a lot of runaways um, also can become truants because uh, a lot of states require youth to attend school 
between the ages of 5 to 18 or within some range within there. And generally, if you have a certain number of unexcused absences within a given month, a semester, or a year, then you would be considered a truant. And habitual truants may be subject to court orders, have to go to counseling, um, custody arrangements might be considered, might have to do community service, and they might have to go to a review board hearing. And truancy is classified as a status offense in six states. That means that you can um, go to juvenile detention. And in some states, parents can also be held accountable for their children's truancy, and they may be fined or jailed. And so you can imagine kind of the, the piling up of, of offenses for young people just because of um, the family situation that they're running from um, or the family that they were ejected from. So it, it's more than just running away. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk briefly about the history and language of the anti-human trafficking movement. So the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act came into existence with at the same time, it was Title III of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. And that, that happened in 1974. So for 40 years, there's been this um, runaway and homeless youth service provider field that has used um, the term survival sex for what we now know as sex trafficking um, and has been providing street outreach and, and interventions and services and housing to um, child prostitutes, which we also now know as sex trafficking. Um, and at the same time, well, not at the same time, but much later, there's this anti-human trafficking movement started and really got um, strong legs in the 90s. And it largely focused on trafficking from an international perspective, from folks um, really with a focus of uh, crossing state or country borders and then state borders. and so. Recently, you know, within the t past 10 years, there's really been a focus on domestic human trafficking, where there's a recognition, or, you know, or with the TVPA, that human trafficking doesn't require any boundaries um, to be crossed. And so now there's this movement of closer together of the runaway and homeless youth provider um, community with this kind of human trafficking community. And, and there's different words, right? Anti-slavery, anti-human trafficking, trafficking in persons, child prostitution, victim, survivor, like all of these different words, right? And often different language, the different words are based on the setting. If you're in a clinical setting, um, you're going to use different words. Maybe you, you start saying victim so that that person um, can understand that they were victimized. Um, but then, then you want to move to a strength-based language, right? You want to start saying survivor. Um, and often for public awareness campaigns, people use more sensationalized um, language to get folks interested, like slavery, um, rescue. And then with policy, we've kind of inherited these legal terms, like, like the definition of runaway or homeless. Um, trafficking in persons, that's within the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, sexual exploitation. Um, but that's, those, aren't the, those policy words aren't what young people, isn't the language that young people are using on the street. Um, and so that there's an impact. Um, like Beth was saying, we want young people to be viewed as victims so that they don't get the criminal response, they get the victim services response. So it's important for us to, to have these young people labeled as victims so that they don't enter the juvenile justice system and they actually get help, healing, and support. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the effective responses to runaway and homeless youth, um, number one, decriminalize status offenses. Um, running away and truancy, that should be an indication that that um, young person and likely family is struggling and needs help and support, not criminalization. Um, so those resources that would go to criminal justice should go to social services, um, housing, and interventions. The other thing we can do is states can pass safe harbor laws that decriminalize sexually exploited minors so that they're treated as victims of a crime 
in need of protection and services. Um, and, and that can be done by granting these young people immunity from prosecution or from diverting these young people from delinquency proceedings and instead directing them to child welfare services or other appropriate um, services for them. Next slide, please. Um, another other effective responses is community-based crisis interventions, mentoring, family strengthening, substance abuse treatment, comprehensive, the more comprehensive services a young person receives, um, the, the better the outcomes are for that young person. The more likely it is that that young per person will be able to heal, um, achieve safety, and enter adulthood safely. Also, street-based outreach services and referrals are very effective. You have to meet young people where they are um, and build a relationship because they don't trust adults. Um, for good reason. If you had walked um, in their shoes for a few days, you would have likely have a difficult time trusting adults as well. Also, youth-appropriate shelters and transitional housing, by and large, young people um, don't feel safe and do not want to access um, traditional adult homeless shelters because they're often victimized or just don't identify with the adult homeless population that's accessing those services. That's why youth-appropriate is key. Um, next slide, please. So I have been talking, um, I have mentioned kind of throughout the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, um, and, and I mentioned that it's, the history is rooted in decriminalizing runaways. The thinking was with the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, with the first two titles, okay, if we're decriminalizing status offenses such as running away, then where are these young people who run away or are homeless, where are they going to live, where are they going to sleep and eat if they're not in detention? So that there and entered um, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, which provides funding directly to community-based organizations um, or public agencies that provide three different federal grant programs, street outreach that provides street-based services, food, referrals, counseling, relationship building. Um, the second thing it provides is a basic center program that's crisis housing and family intervention services for minors. Um, and then for young people who can't reunify with family, who can't go live um, somewhere else safely or enter the foster care system, then there's transitional living programs. That's for 16 to 22-year-olds. You have to be 21 when you enter, but you can stay till you're 22. And it's for almost two years of housing and services in a youth-appropriate therapeutic session um, setting that emphasizes um, re-engagement with education, workforce development, and employment services, along with trauma-informed care and counseling and, and everything young people need. Next slide, please. I wanted to share with you all just two state policy resources that we have. The first one is model state statutes that we wrote with the American Bar Association for Runaway and Homeless Youth. So you can click on that link if you want um, to work on some state legislation. The second one is um, Alone Without a Home, a state-by-state -state review of laws that affect unaccompanied homeless youth. We wrote this with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. and. Um, it's probably a little outdated because it's from September 2012, but you can learn a lot about what the laws are in your state. Um, on that, with that resource, next slide, please. So moving forward, um, we really want to make sure uh, we want to do a better job at decriminalizing um, victims. Young people who are victims are still being criminalized and incarcerated, and so we need to do a better job at the state level and the federal level at making sure that doesn't happen. Um, and laws and policies still need to catch up to the current realities. If you um, and started being a victim of sex trafficking as a, as a minor and no one with any power or authority discovered this until you were 19, no one's figured out yet how to um, legislate the the crimes that were committed at 18 and 19, because there's there's a difference between um, minors and 18 and 18 and older for what is human trafficking. So we need to the laws need to catch up to the reality of the lives of young people, um, and the investments in prevention services and programs still remains extremely low. For example, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, which has been around for 40 years, 
only has $115 million. That's $115 million for all runaway and homeless youth in the U.S., which is far, far, far from meeting the need. Um, and so until we really increase our investments in those areas, young people are still go are going to remain vulnerable um, and victimized. Um, and and as well, there in terms of services dedicated specifically to the survivors of human trafficking, it remains extremely low um, and is also far from meeting the need. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darla. This is Naomi. Um, as Katie mentioned, um, thank you all for joining us today. And I'm with um, CJJ. We're a membership organization that represents state advisory groups. And state advisory groups, as most of you probably know, um, are governor-appointed bodies that administer federal funds at the state level. They help guide state programming related to juvenile justice, and they're really uniquely positioned to address the issue of human trafficking. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the ways that state advisory groups can help in this effort. Um, in fact, a growing number of states are already finding ways to work within this space. As funders, SACs can provide money to help sure, ensure that victims are identified and that the warning signs of trafficking do not go unnoticed. For example, in Florida, the state advisory group there is already providing funds that are used to tr train juvenile justice professionals to spot victims and to recognize signs of victimization, such as tattoos and brands that traffickers can sometimes force their victims to obtain. SACs are also able to create partnerships with local entities that are working in this area. Um, these partnerships can include working with local police, members of the bench and bar, service providers, treatment centers, really a host of different organizations, um, including local and national organizations that are focused on the issue of human trafficking. Arizona SAG, um, by way of an example of the partnerships that are already being formed to work on the issue of human trafficking, has formed a partnership with the Arizona State University's Office of Sex Trafficking Intervention Research. And that office aims to be the central source of information on domestic sex trafficking. SAGs are also able, in their role as funders, to provide money to help support alternative programs that keep kids out of detention centers and provide them with much needed services. Minnesota um, is working in this area, and they've provided funding for several years now to help fund the Ramsey County Runaway Intervention Program. And that program works with girls that have run away from home and have experienced a history of sexual assault and exploitation. Next slide, please. In their role as advisors, um, SAGs also have a number of opportunities. SAGs are in a position to encourage their states to prohibit the prosecution of child victims of sex trafficking. While, as mentioned earlier, the Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act identifies children who are exploited for commercial sex acts as victims, many states continue to prosecute, prosecute children for these acts. Um, a growing number of states are responding by implementing safe harbor laws, which, when properly created, provide protections for children and ensure that they are not prosecuted for their exploitation. SAGs are also able to use their role as advisors to encourage states to ensure that programming addresses the needs of both male and female victims. Um, as the presenters before me mentioned, there are a number of victims who are male. While this issue is traditionally thought of as a female problem, it affects everyone, um, not just girls. Sex can also advocate for trauma-informed care of trafficking victims. Often, boys and girls who are victimized through sex, sex trafficking um, have experienced a great deal of trauma before they come into the system. They've experienced physical, sexual, and emotional trauma um, both while they were victimized and before their victimization. Next slide, please. And SAGs can address the issues related to sex trafficking as part of their overall work related to the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. This doesn't have to be something that's dealt with separately. There are a number of ways in which trafficking and the issues associated with trafficking affect SAGs' work related to the JJDPA. As most of you all likely already know, um, the JJDPA is the key federal legislation related to juvenile justice, and it provides four core protections for youth who are involved in the system. Under the JJDPA, states are required to deinstitutionalize youth who engage in status offense behaviors, remove young people from adult jails and lockups, 
ensure sight and sound separation of adults and youth if they are detained in the same facilities, and address disproportionate minority contacts within their system. Next slide, please. The first requirement of the JJDPA, deinstitutionalization of youth who engage in status offense behaviors, prohibits states from placing children who are charged with status offenses in secure confinement. And status offense behaviors, they vary by state, but they are essentially behaviors that are illegal, that violate the law only because the person who committed them is younger than the age of majority, which in most states is 18. Common examples of these behaviors include running away from home, skipping school, and being out after curfew. As you heard from Darla, um, these sort of behaviors are often the ways in which children who are victims of sex trafficking come, in, come into the court's attention. That can help ensure that child victims who are brought before the court for status offense behaviors are not incarcerated. Next slide, please. As we mentioned earlier, Victims and their traffickers often have complex relationships with one another. This is especially important to keep in mind as it relates to adult jail removal and sight and sound separation. Young victims are often exploited by their traffickers. They may be threatened with physical or emotional abuse if they decide to leave or if they give over the name and identity of their trafficker. And in order to protect themselves and their trafficker, they may falsify information about their age. It's very important that to overcome this and ensure that children are not placed in adult jails and lockups, SAGs ensure that professionals receive adequate training to identify victims and their true age. Next slide, please. DMC is also important to keep in mind when you're addressing trafficking issues. The Department of Justice reports that African American and Hispanic youth are both more likely to be victims of exploitation. SAGs should be mindful of these racial and ethnic disparities when they are creating plans to help address and combat racial and ethnic disparities in their communities. Similarly, staff should provide programming that is culturally and linguistically competent. Um, and now I think we have a few minutes left over for questions. Okay, great. Please. I want to thank our presenters. Um, as you can um, see, you can enter your questions into the questions box, or you can click the raise your hand button for, um, to unmute your questions. So I'll just give everyone a few minutes to do that. Um, while I'm doing that, um, I just want to say that we have the contact information for our three speakers on the phone right now, uh, or on the, excuse me, on the screen right now. Um, and also the PowerPoint and the recording of this webinar will be available on CJJ's website. Um, so if you missed any information on the slides, they will be up on CJJ's website within 24 hours. Additionally, I saw a few questions about contact information for state advisory groups. You can also visit juvjustice.org, and we have information on JJ specialists and SAG chairs in each state. Um, so our first question for our presenters is, how can people working in, ju in the juvenile justice system identify trafficking victims, and how do you do this without stigmatizing them? Darla Beth, would you like to tackle that, or Naomi? Yeah, so that, uh, that question in and of itself could be the topic of an entire, entirely separate webinar, uh, which I will say, you know, there is going to be a series that will delve deeper into red flags and indicators, but also assessment questions. But, you know, generally, any youth-focused agency um, really has a, a strong role to play, um, and I'd invite them to consider implementing screening tools to identify trafficking within their context. There's a lot of great resources out there, which I can connect with uh, Naomi and Katie and Darla afterwards to compile if that's feasible. Um, but we really want to be training staff to identify and understand the needs of these victims because as, as we've illustrated, it's very nuanced and uh, that continuum of care uh, lasts long into adulthood. Um, but also providing and facilitating access to comprehensive services. So recognizing them as victims, um, collaborating with local agencies aimed at prevention and ensuring that there is this holistic response. And I think, as Darla said, you just meeting them where they are, um, being victim-centered, being non-judgmental non um, and gender responsive, really, in your policies is really going to help to help them recover in, in whatever that personalized um, process is. 
Okay, our next question is, can you talk about the VCO exception and strategies to train judges not to use it as often as it is often applied to trafficking victims in juvenile justice context? Sure, this is Naomi. Um, I'll start off on that one. So a lot of the work that CJJ has done in recent years has focused on the valid court order exception. For those who might be on the phone who don't know what VCO stands for, um, under the VCO, children who otherwise would not be permitted to be incarcerated for a status offense, if they've gone to court before and the judge has said, for example, you need to stop skipping school, if that child continues to skip school, they can be found in violation of the valid court order and incarcerated for their behavior. Um, one of the things that we have produced is the national standards, um, and that gives some guidance on how states can better serve kids who have, for example, run away from home or are found to be truant. Really, it's a matter of community-based programming and finding ways to meet the underlying needs of these children. A lot of times, kids are engaging in behaviors that would be considered status offenses because there's something else going on at home. Um, and there might be any number of things from abuse, neglect. These sort of problems, if we can address the underlying issue, go a lot farther than placing a child in incarceration. I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add. Nope, that sums it up. OK, um, I'll read our next question, but I just know that we had several participants ask a similar question. So. It's a pretty popular topic. Is there a validated risk or needs assessment tool that has a focus on identifying at-risk youth who may become potential victims of child sex exploitation? I'm, this is Darla. I'm not aware um, of, of that tool. There's a lot of risk assessment tools. I know that there are. Um, kind of tested surveys, Covenant House did um, a survey, but that was to identify young people who had been sex or labor trafficked um, within a, you know, and who were currently in a runaway and homeless youth program. I know that there are a lot of kind of risk assessment tools in general. Um, and I think if you're, if you're vulnerable and at risk, <laughs> then um, it's to any type of victimization, including human trafficking. I don't know, um, Beth, are you aware of any? Um, the, the National Hotline has some trafficking assessment tools specific to RHY populations that were kind of developed in collaboration. Um, I know, and this is a recent tool that was released, but the Vera Institute of Justice just released a tool for identifying victims of trafficking broadly that talks about that trauma-informed perspective. Um, and does include youth, but those are those are what comes to mind. Yeah, so nothing that kind of predicts whether a young person is at risk, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Are there states that have particularly good laws or programs to protect trafficking victims that other states can look to for an example? Yes. <laughs> Um, Polaris Project, I think, has a list of like 15 states with really good, pretty good safe harbor laws. Um, I would say that that is a resource that's on Polaris's website. And then in terms of provision of services, I wouldn't say entire states, but I would say areas. So the Twin Cities um, in Minnesota, so Minneapolis and St. Paul, are pretty coordinated um, and organized in providing services to runaway and homeless youth, and they're also kind of coordinated around human trafficking. The same with Seattle. Um, Seattle is pretty organized, and they have a pretty robust service delivery system for um, homeless youth. Um, so those would be kind of my thoughts in terms of youth homelessness, and then in terms of safe harbor laws, I would definitely defer to Polaris. Yeah, and I can, I can pull that resource from our website to, to share with registrants after this webinar. Great.
Great. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Um, Beth, if you want to send me that resource, I can post it on CJ's website along with the PowerPoint and the recording of this webinar. Um, if we didn't get a chance to get to your question, the contact information of our presenters is up on the screen, or you can send me an email with your question at mercier -E at juvejustice.org. And with that, I'd like to thank all three of our presenters, and that concludes our webinar. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.